Hello, my name is Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound. Here at the University of Puget Sound, I teach courses in microbiology, introduction to research methods, introductory cell and molecular biology, and this year, a freshman writing seminar that we call the Seminar and Scholarly Inquiry 165, Never Really Alone, Symbioses and Parasitism Around and Within Us. I selected this topic so that students with an interest in science would be able to make choices that got them excited as they wrote short-term papers, response pieces, and the like. As part of this class, I've been very fortunate in having some famous and interesting people give us a telepresence in the classroom to discuss issues of interest. In the past, I've had some fabulous people, and here at the end of my course, toward the end anyway, we have Associate Professor of Biological Sciences Rob Dunn of North Carolina State University. Professor Dunn wrote one of the textbooks that I use in this course, Your Wild Life, which I highly recommend. There is very little that Professor Dunn is not involved with in terms of research. But he decided to talk a little bit today with my class about the face mites that live on pretty much all of us. And I think you will enjoy hearing what he has to say. In addition, Professor Dunn also spoke about some of his interest in other programs. And finally, the networks that exist within us all. And this fits very much the idea behind my course, that we are in fact an anthology of different organisms, walking ecologies if you were. We're very excited to have Professor Dunn join us, and I hope that you enjoy what he has to say. Background and why we work on these mites. And it relates to my general understanding and, and about the universe, which is that the closer something is to us, and the le so long as it's not deadly, that we tend to miss everything about it. And so unless something actively bothers us, um, we tend not to study it. And so I, mean, I think that, that most of the literature about the species that live on our bodies that you'll read in this class, people act as though the discoveries about these things are totally new, that we didn't know about the microbiome, that we're making all these new and exciting discoveries. And in part that's true, but it's also true that we've had an inkling that these things were going on since the 1800s and nobody paid much attention to them. Some of these things we've known about since the 1600s and nobody paid much attention to them. And, and it's because I think all these things that are immediate to us but, but not things that are killing us, there's not a field of study or there hasn't been that, that deals with them. And the mites for me are the most incredible example of this because here you have an animal living on your face, it lives on your arms, it lives all over you. And until we started studying them, um, I think somebody just walked up to your room and took a picture of the room. That was the weirdest thing ever. Um, until we started studying them, there were one or two people in the world who actively studied these mites, um, which to me is just astonishing. Uh, and so that's our starting point, which is that I mean, we get to do pretty much anything we want with these mites because they're, they're just totally unknown. And so a lot of your questions, my answers are going to be that I don't know. And so instead of just saying I don't know again and again, I'm going to wildly speculate in response to each question because that seems like way more fun. Um, and so I'm going to go sort of in, in order here, hopping around these questions that I've been given, which were actually really good ones. And um, as indicated by the fact that I don't know the answers to most of them. And so Emma Casey, is the, this is one of the first questions, um, is the very first one. And Emma asks, uh, face mites are incredibly common, so much so that they've been found in every mammal except the platypus and their egg-laying relatives. Is this surprising? Um, I don't know much about monotremes or how their genetic makeup varies from that of the rest of the mammalian kingdom, but is it known what characteristics the egg layers lack that um, lead to either not being a desirable host for face mites or two, not needing face mites. Um, is it known that is it known that whales have face mites? So this is a fantastic question because the truth is, you guys must be a little bit time delayed because reactions are like two seconds after I say something. Either that or I'm funny slowly. Um, no, it's delayed. Uh, so. 
it turns out that people have only looked for mites in about 27 mammal species. There are 5,000 some mammal species on Earth. Um, I will hypothesize until somebody really shows it not to be true that essentially all of those mammals have at least two of their own mite species, which is to say that there could be 10,000 mite species on mammals that remain to be found. Um, and so does the platypus really not have them? That's a hard thing to show, and, and I would guess that they probably do have them. But if they don't, it would be really interesting. Um, but the, the truth is, I mean, we, we just have no idea. And so, I mean, one measure of how ignorant we are about a question like that is that we went into the, in my building, well, the building next to mine, North Carolina State, uh, people keep mice and voles, and they're sterile mice and sterile voles. And so we thought, well, let's check those for mites. And we haven't gotten done checking the mice, but in the first vole we looked at, there was a mite. Well, there aren't any mites reported for the voles, and so that one's probably a new species. And, and so the truth is, I mean, I think if you just went around your campus and grabbed every mammal you could and brought them back and started looking for mites, that you'd be finding new species after new species. Now, in some cases, they're pretty deep in there, so you have to be comfortable grinding the mammal up with that kind of stuff, which for a first-year class is maybe not ideal. But, but you'd find them. Um, the second question I was going to look at was another Emma. And I'll, I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Um, uh, the two species of Demodex mites living on our face aren't even closely related, and one of them appears to be universally shared among humans regardless of location. Um, for example, China and the Americas. However, the article does not go into detail the differences between the two mites or their role in human anatomy. Are there any specific or important differences between the two face mites other than where they live in your face? So that's a super good question. And so uh, for most of the history of the study of these mites, they were thought to be just one species because they look really similar. They're kind of elongate. They kind of look like a follicle, right? And so uh, that was the first half of the entirety of the study of these mites. It was one species. Um, then in the 1960s, it was discovered they looked a little bit different and that those differences were consistent. And so then they were named as two separate species. And one's kind of short and fat, and the other one's sort of long and, and carrot-shaped. And the short, fat one goes way down deep into the sebaceous glands. And the long carrot-shaped one is the one you often see in pictures with their little tails sticking out, folliculorum. Um, and our general sense is that folliculorum is maybe moving around a little bit more. Maybe it's transferred among people more often. Um, but in terms of what they eat, what their biology is, how different they might be, we really don't know. And the recent genetic work actually suggests that they might be as much as 100 million years divergent. Um, which would suggest that not only are they not each other's closest relatives, but that they're, they're more different than we are from an elephant. Um, but they have similar shapes because they live in a similar place. And so, from my perspective, it suggests that biochemically, in terms of how they're dealing with the host, they could be totally different. And, and so that there might be really, really interesting um, differences there that we could look for, but we haven't yet. Um, and there's some pretty basic chemistry you could do, you know, in maybe a second year class, uh, even in a writing class, um, to, to figure out stuff we don't know in that context. Um, let's see. What do humans and dogs have that makes them more appealing to Demodex compared to any other animal? Um, I don't think they are. Uh, I think we just, they're just easier to grab and study. Um, that said, uh, we do sometimes have more trouble finding the mites on some furry things than on humans. And I don't, I, it's hard to know if that's because the, the bald spaces of our skin are easier to get the mites on than the furry sp spaces on, say, a chipmunk. Um, we don't really have a good way to estimate how abundant they are on living organisms, and even on dead organisms, it's hard. And so the comparative abundance is pretty unclear. But 
my guess is that we're just more likely to grab a, a dog or a human than we are other animals. Um, another one, um, why is the age of 18 the magic number? And this refers to the idea uh, that these mites seem to become universal on, on adults, at least in the populations we've sampled, at around the age of 18. Um, does it have something to do with puberty? And how are we culturally, how we are culturally raised? For example, the Tokelo Islanders. Oh, the Tokelo Islanders is an example where, um, those of you who read this might have seen this, but those of you who haven't, um, would not, where the children seem to all have mites, or mostly have mites, and the adults don't, which is the opposite of what we've seen for Western populations so far. Um, also, could there be more face mite species on different regions of our faces based on uh, where we may touch our faces? Super good questions. Um, so, in terms of 18, yeah, it's, it's, it's totally possible that puberty is playing a role here. Um, we know that our glands change dramatically with puberty, and so uh, the apocrine sweat glands, for example, will start to produce really different things during puberty and to get much bigger. And, and so it may be that there's something about those changes and what our, our sweat glands are producing that change what's available for the mites. It's also possible it's just biophysical, right, that the, our hair follicles change in, in, in size in such a way that by the time you're 18, it's easy for a bunch of mites to get into them. Um, we can't exclude the possibility um, that they're just harder to find on children. And here, here um, there's an interesting example from breast milk, which is that for years people talked about the breast milk of humans as being sterile. And it was just sort of the, the dogma that it's a sterile substance until somebody looked and it turned out that breast milk is not only not sterile, but the body seems to fill breast milk um, with bifidobacterium, this very specific bacteria that helps to break down um, uh, good stuff in breast milk. And so this was a really big revelation. It changed how we thought about breast milk. But what nobody's figured out yet is how those microbes get into the breast milk. We think that they go through the lymph. But if you look in adult women who are not lactating, they don't necessarily seem to have this bacterium. And so it's not clear where it is, but, but it must be in the body somewhere and then be getting moved up um, with lactation. And so it may be that the mites are around, but just much rarer. And so that seems pretty open. Um, the second part of that was, could there be more face mites on different regions of our faces based on where we may touch our faces? Yeah, I think that's possible. Um, we don't know at all how they move from person to person. We do know that um, people seem to keep their face mites for uh, quite a number of years, even when they move other places. And so it suggests that... Um, although they must be transferring, maybe they're not transferring so, so readily. Um, at the same time, the fact that we see them on everybody suggests that they, they're pretty good at dispersing. Um, but we have no idea. The other thing we don't know is if they're all over uh, what we call fomites, and so like non-human things that might transfer them. And so if you're looking at where you're setting your food right now in the classroom, like the red cup in the front, like, is that cu cup covered in face mites? Um, <laughs> uh, we, we don't know. That's actually something that could be tested relatively easy, easily because, you see, now you don't want to drink it, do you? Um, sorry about that. Um, that's good. Uh, so we could, you could test if there's face mite DNA on that cup. We haven't looked yet. As far as I know, nobody else has either. But that would be interesting. You know, are we getting transfer within a classroom? In which case, you might see swapping of a whole bunch of different lineages around the room. Um, and if you look at the, the paper in which we compare the uh, Demonix brevis and folliculorum, we see that folliculorum seems to have less genetic structure, which is what we might expect if it's moving around a lot more. And it has less genetic structure even over really big geographic areas. Um, and so it's possible it gets up into the air. It's possible it rides on planes. It's possible they're landing on you all the time. Um, 
we really have no idea, which, which is pretty wild to me, right? I mean, that we have no idea if right now, as you listen to me talk, mites are just falling out of the sky onto you. Um, you'd think that's the kind of thing somebody would have figured out. Uh, and this goes back to, there's another question later about rosacea. Let's see if I can pull it up quick. Whose question was that? Does one of you remember? Oh, there it is. Um, I'm not going to, I'll just paraphrase it if you uh, don't begrudge me that. Um, basically the question was, uh, if we've had these mites for so long, why might they cause rosacea? And one possibility is that the mites are producing compounds that calm down our immune system. There's so many of them, and it seems very, very likely that they're doing that. Worms do that. Some bacteria even do that. Protists do it. And so they likely do that. But if they do that, um, it's very likely that the, the compounds they use might differ among host species. So they might use different ones for chimps or for dogs. And so if we're now swapping mites way more often, it's possible that the people with rosacea have a mite or a mite bacteria um, that's less adapted at avoiding the immune response in the host. Um, and so it's a, it's a novel mismatch of partners. Um, that's, that's one explanation, but I think the intuition of that question is very, very good. Um, that we just don't expect to see that rosacea in this old, old relationship, especially in as much as the, the mites don't seem to be benefiting a ton when they cause rosacea. And so, you know, you might imagine that sometimes the mites do better than us, and sometimes we do better than the mites. But with rosacea, we're both sort of losing. Um, and so the, I think that's a, that's a pretty interesting mystery. Um, Yeah, the second part of that question I just found out is, are there any species of pneumonics that reside in other man um, animal species that cause irritation? Yeah, so there are, there are um, I've been working some here in Denmark with a, with a zoo, and in the zoo there are a number of species for whom pneumonics cause what's called pneumonic mange, and that's, that's another inflammatory problem. But as with, with rosacea, it's not clear whether the mites that are causing the mange are the mites that the species evolved with. Because we don't, I mean, no one's ever sampled mites off of wolves. And so we don't know, do the dogs actually have dog mites or do they have human mites? Um, nobody's ever sampled these mites off of chimps or gorillas. And so we don't really know. I mean, it's just, we have teeny, teeny leaves off a giant tree and we're trying to figure out what the tree looks like. Um, and we're sketching a lot. It's probably fair to say. Um, oh, this is from, from Aiden Lawler. Um, this is a good question, Aiden. How do the different species of mites interact with each other? Would Demotics brevis from European or Asian people be able to live in other, on people from America, even though they're genetically distinct from one another? Um, yeah, so there's sort of two questions there. The first is, I mean, if you have folliculorum and brevis in the same person, uh, do they interact? Um, I have no idea, but that that's fascinating. Um, you know, brevis, once they get established, are going deeper into the follicle and into the sebaceous gland, but it's totally possible that they're bumping into each other in the night. Um, and, and so it's possible they're competing. It's possible they're producing compounds to try to uh, do evil to the other one. Um, that would be really fun to study. People have kept these in culture, but as far as I know, they've never kept the two in culture together to see what happens. That'd be cool. The second part of the question is related to the different, um, what we would call uh, clades or strains of the individual species. And so would Demodex brevis from uh, European or Asian people be able to live on people from America even though they're genetically distinct from one another? So that would be a great experiment that we won't ever get permission to do um, because when we, what we actually see is that people that immigrate seem to keep the mites from the place that they're from. And so either that is suggesting 
the, the, the mites are really good at getting passed from generation to generation, or there's something about hosts that are different um, such that a mite really wants the host population of humans that it evolved with. I think that what we'll need to do to get at that question will be to look at non-human mites. And so mice have tons of these. And so we can actually do transplant experiments where we take mites from one mouse and transplant it to another strain of mouse. And we can see what are, how host-specific are they and what makes them so host-specific. Um, but yeah, the question for humans is very interesting. Um, it may be we can um, get at some aspects of that question through some, some cool genetic approaches where we can actually look at which genes are being favored um, in one population versus another to start to think about whether some of those are adaptive. Um, but that's a long road and we're, we're on early steps of, of that uh, traveling. Um, do people have, I'll go back through some more of these questions, but are people have other questions to follow up on what I'm saying now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, and, and this is really interesting stuff. We recently listened to a podcast from a couple of Scottish researchers that are working on, on and actually thank you for correcting my pronunciation. I always want to say Demodex, and it's Demodex. Is that correct? Oh, uh, I mean, if somebody was speaking Latin, they could correct us, but I'm probably saying it wrong, too. But we always say it Demodex. I think we say it more than other people, so we could just win. You're the one. You're the one. Yeah. You're the. You're the one. You're the one studying it. Could you Could you tell the, the students how you collect them from people? So we just swab from people with like a Q-tip. Um, it's also possible to take a scrape, and so you. Um, this is historically what was done, where you take sort of an aggressive scrape and run it across the head. Um, uh, if people are dead, you can sort of dig into the follicle and actually pull it out. We don't tend to do that, but that's a pretty big part of the literature. Um, and with non-human mammals, we have to get creative because it's not always clear where they are. And so some of the species in lemurs live in their noses or in their throats. And so when we know nothing, we're kind of guessing where they should be. So how about you folks? Anyone have a particular question for Professor Dunn? Let me plug in my cord while you're thinking of your question. You know, Dave, you're always in the middle of the photograph. Isn't this great? It just always happens. I'm wondering if you're the source of all the mites. <laughs> well, you have to you have to ask that question about how to get my I right. uh, here, you guys got your question? Yes, Larry has one. There you are. You might have to say it again, Mark, because I can't I can't hear the She's asking about rosacea. Go ahead, Terry. So what she's asking, Rob, is if rosacea is caused by face mites exploding, I love that concept, um, would there therefore be the possibility of transmissible rosacea? Um, boy, that's an interesting question. So it would just be short term because it's just the immune, it's just the, the local immune response to their presence. And so it's not, it's not a pathogen, it's really the, the microbe in the understanding of this recent work, it's really the microbe that's generating that yeah. um, response. And so if the current understanding is right, which is not totally clear, um, then what you would expect would be um, that maybe if you got enough spray of exploding mites from your neighbor, right? So if you guys leaned in in the front row there and somebody had exploding mites, that maybe it could generate a really local immune response. But I think it's pretty unlikely. Um, 
but we don't know what's in the mites, and so it's not off the table that they are vectors of things. That's cool. Actually, Tori, Tori here in front, wait, Tori, was asking about trying to test people here to see if they have face mites, and I told her about the whole IRB problem. Um, maybe you can address that with them. Yeah, so we can, um, so we could swab you to, to be tested for the mites, um, but you couldn't swab you for the mites unless you had an in internal review board approval. And so internal review board, um, and I just unfortunately shorted out my electricity in my house, and so if I go off for a second, I apologize extremely in advance. Um, wow. uh, and I'll switch computers. Um, so... It's, it's to protect participants in studies, right? To protect you from studies like those in which you might experimentally add mites and afterward we find out that, oh, they actually transmit syphilis. Um, and, so, and so because people did those experiments in the 60s, these review boards were set up to deal with that kind of problem. And so they're really a, um, a wondrous and useful thing. Um, Okay, froze. All right, well, I think he'll be back. Yeah, we're here. We'll see if he comes back, and I think he will. Apparently, he's doing this from home made a power failure. Or maybe the mics didn't want him to talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's in North Carolina. Well, you know what? I, I'm not sure. He might be in Europe right now. Yeah, he, he might be in Denmark right now. You're right. Well, I, I was wondering about that. He had quite the nice background light. So what I wanted to remind everyone is that at the end of class today, I will keep my phone up in the morning in case he's emailing me. And we can, I don't know if we do in that case. We do the best we can. What I was going to say is I have commentary on your um, drafts of your term papers, and, and it's over there at the end. I'd like you to pick them up. Please don't do it now. Um, there's also an opportunity for extra credit based on today in your handout, and there's some stuff to read for Friday as well. I get really excited when we do these things, and I want to make sure it's all there. So take a chance to grab some, um, some stuff to drink, and we'll see what the situation is. And I'm sure that we will be back shortly. Pretty cool that he'll do this from Denmark. What were you going to say? So what I was thinking is um, if you could get a classroom where like, basically no one in the class is going to to each other, if you could somehow like, from the beginning of the semester collect the samples of them before they enter the classroom, mm -hmm. and then continue sampling them and the surface of the classroom throughout the semester and see if there's like, proof of transfer. Well, I think this is a fabulous idea. I mean, and I, I don't mean to, to be uh, difficult with you, but you think about traveling by plane. All Sorry, plane. guys, I'm back. Hey, good to see you. We were talking about mites raining down from the sky, Rob. Yeah, so, so um, with regard to IRB, the, um, I mean, it's this wonderful process to ensure that people that participated in projects are protected. Um, and so it makes it, it's what, when I was saying earlier, it'd be easier to study mice for some of these questions. Um, it makes it hard to ask some of the direct questions you'd love to know about humans. Um, but because some of these things we know so little about, that we, we, it's hard to think about on our own all of the ramifications of studying them without being sufficiently thoughtful. These internal review boards exist to do that. Um, and so they're, they're quite a great thing. But with our internal review board, we have approval to, to have uh, people like you sample your own mites and to work with us to then study them. Other questions in the room? Anybody else have one? I know Tori wants to be checked out. There isn't a possibility of, of any kits left over, are there? I'll ask. That would be nice. Go ahead, Gabe. Um, yeah, ask about anything. I mean, not too personal, but... <laughs> um, so, there isn't really very much known about how mites travel from one person to another person. Um, 
Is there like somewhere that you could research that, or like what sort of knowledge do you have on that? How like if we all have different, slightly different lights in different areas, how can like how do they transfer from one person to the next? Yeah. So the first thing that we're starting to do, and we have a glimpse at this, but it's not complete enough to say anything really conclusive, is that we can look at whether children and their parents tend to share the same mites. And so we can look at mothers versus fathers, and then we can look at married people. And, and so, you know, if they're really transmitted from mother to child and it happens early but we miss them on kids, we expect the strong mother-child link in terms of which lineage of mite you have. If it's proximity, we expect both parents to offer them. Um, and even that married couples might start to share them. And so we would have some hint of that uh, from more data, and data we just don't have yet. Um, I think the second thing is just finding out if they're out there in the environment. You know, is your classroom full of that, them? Um, and we'll have some data on that pretty soon. We're using what people tend to call eDNA approaches, where you just get some dust and look at the DNA present in the dust to tell who's there. And so um, if we were to swab actually the table in front of you with a single finger, finger full of you know, dust, um, we would get 1,500 species from that swab of fungi and bacteria, not to mention things like the mites. Uh, and that starts to tell us about who's falling in different places. And from doing that, we've actually found um, in houses, we've found more species of fungus than there are named fungi in North America. <laughs> Just based on what's floating around in the dust. And so the idea that there's unknown stuff there, I mean, is, is, is uh, it's easy, right? There's unknown stuff everywhere. You're covered in it. And it's both the stuff you evolved with, it's the stuff you picked up in some dorm and some, you know, creepy, scuzzy part of a dorm. It's stuff that, you know, fell on you as you walked outside. And we're at this point where we really can't distinguish those very different possibilities yet, for the most part, for the exception of a really, really narrow subset of species. Um, and some of these things are actually pretty easy to study, and we just have it. I think the mites are not so hard. I see Mark's arm. Is that the arm of doom, or is that? <laughs> no, Rob. We have one of those um, things that keep reminding us about, you know, um, computer issues, and they put up this person. I have no idea who it is, but it always shows up when you need to relog in. So everything's fine. I just had to move that window. Oh, got it. Other questions about the, about the book, about other things? Oh, yeah. I mean, one I, part I, of what we do. Say how right in the front. They love your book. I got to tell you that. But Robin, did Thank you have a question? Yeah, I had a question about, um, I don't know if you know if, or if you've read Judah Rosner's letter to Micro about the 10 to 1 ratio of um, my, like microbial cells to human cells. Um, uh -huh. and what, I don't know what you think about that, whether or not um, it might be more or less, or like what crossover there is between the human genome and kind of the microbiome. Um, in, my, in my current microbiology class, we, talk, we talked uh, briefly about the idea of a hologenome um, and the crossover between, yeah, basically human genes and the microbiome. So. Yes, yeah, so those super interesting questions. I mean, so I think one of the really fun things is that that 10 to 1 number, so we think about all this stuff as being new and fancy. The 10 to 1 number is based on a study from 1945. Okay. So we knew 10 to 1. 1945, right? I don't think any of you were alive then, probably. Um, <laughs> Definitely not. Not even me. Seems like old days. But it's not that old in days. But so we've known it fine, right? And we've just ignored it. It's not been part of the big story. And, but but it's, it's true. I mean, in terms of species, that's true. It's also true of our individual cells, right? Your cells are composed of two microbial lineages that came together like, you know, chocolate and peanut butter. Um, and, and so your entirety is really microbial. Um, and so I think that's interesting, and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. There are also all these phages, right, that are attacking the microbes, and so there's this active war that influences how and who you are. Um, 
But then the other piece that I think we have less of a handle on that I think is more important, and if I were to write the wildlife for our bodies again, I'd, I'd write more about this, is that um, if we compare ourselves to chimps, you know, if we look at coding genes or whatever your favorite metric, we're between 80 and 97 percent similar, right? And you go to the zoo and you look at the chimp and you have this interaction and you feel sort of at one. But if you look at the microbes of you and a chimp, they're far more different than that. And if you look at the species interactions of, of you and a chimp, they're even more di different in general. And, and so, I mean, I think this is a fundamental attribute of being a modern human, that our genes have changed a little, but our, the web of interactions we have, the hologenome, but here I'm including agriculture and everything else, it has changed a hundredfold more than our genes have changed. And, and that's a huge part of what makes us who we are, both in terms of good things and bad things. Um, I mean, I, I've, we've been compiling a list of the pathogens of, from other people's lists of humans and of uh, chimps, for example. And this is not symbionts. This is just things we know are bad. And the list of chimps is about 50. And most of them are sort of not really very bad. You know, they're worms that, you know, on a bad day they eat too much of your food and that sucks. Um, but, but most of the time it's pretty okay. Some of these protists and, and chimps are probably actually symbionts. We just haven't studied them. Anybody care to guess what the number of uh, pathogens and parasites species known from humans is? Go ahead, Robin. You're in my micro class. <laughs> You're on the spot. Uh, so is this like identified ever from humans? <laughs> uh, uh, reg regular, like each year they're on somebody. Oh, okay. Holy crap. Around the world? Yeah. <laughs> Quit temporizing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm just going to go with my gut and say like, oh, literally, and, <laughs> and say like, uh, 10,000? Yeah, so, well, so the number of, of regular ones is 2,000. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rob, I, I often tell people... 10,000 is probably a real number for each year if you include the guy that accidentally got a camel worm and, uh, um, you know, that kind of thing. But, but, but just in that comparison, 50 and 2,000, there's a huge difference. Now that's the collective comparison. Well, what does the average chimp have and what does the average human living in New Jersey have? Well, that's totally different, right? Because the average chimp actually has probably four or five species of worms. And the average human living in New Jersey has no worms. Or maybe it has, you know, an itchy butt pinworm. But that would be about it. And so on the one hand, where our collective exposure is really added all these species or individual exposure, can in developed countries be very, very different. And, and so, you know, if you want to think about who you are as a human, I think that hologenome concept is an interesting one, but it takes a, a really fascinating thing and, and turns it into a, a boring word. Um, but, uh, but, but imagine yourself as this network, right? So you're your body and all of these connections between your body and the species you interact with. For each one of you, what that network looks like is different. And it affects how your brain works, how your gut works, how your immune system works. It affects everything about you. And then they interact with others. So there's a cloud around us, I think, Rob. And yeah, that's right. If you've heard of cloud computing, this is even more. And it's funny because I have a lot of people in this classroom who don't want to necessarily be science majors. And they respond to a fear of the small. You can call it microphobia if you want. I call it perulephobia. And I was watching as you're talking about things on the desktops, and, and people are looking all kind of nervous about it. And I've often said that pathogens, number one, it's all about context. It's not about like determination. And secondarily, the ones that are bad are like the juvenile delinquents. They're, they're few in number, but they get all the press. We don't hear about the quiet ones that are all around us all the time, which is why your work is so interesting. Yeah, so I think that's absolutely right. And um, I, mean, I think that the social insects are interesting in this context. So 
when people start, first started to study the genomes of social insects, their prediction was that social insects, because they're like us and social, would have tons more pathogens and would have immune systems with many more genes. What they found instead is the opposite, that social insects appear to have fewer immune genes than solitary things. And so it looks as though what's happened is that, like us, they went through this early phase in their societies when selection was really high, when, when they might have been exposed to more pathogens, but they dealt with it not through more souped-up immune systems, but instead through public health. <laughs> and, and so they created, and this is by grooming, it's by farming beneficial microbes, but they created environments in their nests that are really healthy for them, so much so that they, they can sort of relax their immune system and quit spending so much energy on it. And what's interesting is that that healthy environment they've created, and they're better at it than us, right, because they've had 100 million years to do it. We've tried to do it with culture really in the last 5,000 and in some ways in the last 150. But what they've done is not to create an environment that's devoid of life, but one that's incredibly diverse, but where they're gardening specific things. So what I would say is you think about a classroom like the one you're in, you think about your house, you think about the world around you, that our default approach to the life in that world for the entirety of, of history and prehistory was to kill stuff that scared us. And all of you have benefited from that approach, right? Some of your ancestors didn't get eaten by big predators because that happened. Some of your ancestors didn't have all their crops eaten by a pest that was eating everything because of, of the use of DDT. So some of you uh, are alive because of the use of antibiotics. Probably if, if, we, if we took all those things out of the, of the picture, maybe a tenth of you would be alive, right? And so killing stuff benefited us. And that was the early phase these social insects would have gone through. But now we need to figure out how to garden a world around us of things that also benefit us. Because when we kill stuff, what the result is, if that's all we do, is no world that's devoid of life. It's not a room that's devoid of life. It's a, it's a room full of really tough things that withstands the killing, right? Um, it's a world of rats, pesticide-resistant roaches, and antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And so what we need to think about is the reality that your body, everything you touch, is going to be covered in life. That's a foregone conclusion. And so the only choice you're, prevented, you're presented with is thinking about how do we manage that life in some better way. And, and so I would argue that that's the choice that's about, in part, individual decisions. Um, it's also about getting better science, but it's a choice that's as relevant to, you know, an early medieval studies major as it is to a microbiologist. Um, and, and it's a choice that whether you, you know, there, you have to make it. Uh, and the default is ju just that you kill stuff and favor bad things. You, those of you who have sort of microbophobia, you know, that, that's what you'll do, right? And so if you go home and you think, oh, I need to clean this stuff out of my room, go ahead because you're going to create conditions for things that are actually dangerous. Um, that's not a great idea. I don't really mean go ahead. But that, that's the consequence, right? Um, and, and, and so what I would argue is instead is we need to figure out how do we garden these things that are beneficial. Given that, we only exist in relation to these creatures. You know, who, whoever you like or don't like in this classroom, however gross it seems that they're covered in microbes, they only exist in relation to those microbes. They only exist in relation to the species that they digest um, or are related to. And so that's our story. And it's one we've had trouble embracing, I think. And, you know, the, to me, it's telling that Leeuwenhoek, you know, in the 1600s starts figuring out what microbes are and their story. And nobody follows up on his work for 100 years. Uh, because we have trouble dealing with the idea that we're composed of these multitudes, and yet the fact that we have trouble with it in no way changes the reality. We're, we're a community, all of us. Yeah, question in the front? Um, I really like the section in your book where you talked about the pronghorn and the American cheetah, 
and how that was linked to the perform and the immune system. And it kind of got me to thinking more about even more predator prey relationships in the human body, including the immune system. And um, I was thinking that maybe some um, immune diseases might be caused not by an um, disbalance between the immune system and some prey, but rather some type of bacteria and another bacteria where one's a predator and one's a prey. And the predator is vanished from, doesn't exist in the human body anymore. And it's the prey that goes out of control and kind of causes the disease. Is there anything like that? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So um, the place I would look for that would be with phages and bacteria. And so, you know, phages are the lions of our guts. And, um, and really, I mean, like a couple of years ago, we had the very first study trying to catalog which phages live in our guts. And so it's really an early literature. And yet we know that there are these phages specific for individual lineages of microbes. And everything we know about ecology and evolution suggests that their populations should have big effects on what's going on with your microbes. Um, and you can imagine the conditions that allow them to do well could be very different from those that allow the microbes to do well, or specific microbes. Um, yeah, so it would be great to think about all of the consequences we can imagine for our gut microbes just as a function of what we know about predator-prey dynamics from pronghorn or wherever else. I think it's a great question. We have about five minutes left, Rob. Any, any other questions? How about the sleeping person in the very back? <laughs> I was just teasing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was nobody sleeping. I was just teasing. No, no, no. Um, Amaya, Amaya actually brought something up that we're talking about on Friday. This has to do with blood flukes. And there was a story that the blood fluke males and females were monogamous for decades, but it turns out that in fact there's a certain degree of cheating that's going on. You know, that, that myth has been exploded. And Carl Zimmer did a nice essay on that. And one of the reasons I like that story, and we're talking about it on Friday, is it, it says something that we're discussing here. It's all about a community. It's even inside your bloodstream, even on the surface of your body, all the interactions between things. What we see in the large world, we see in the small. And uh, I, I guess in this last couple of minutes, Maybe I could get you, uh, Rob, to give them, you know, some final words of sage advice that they're never really alone. Yeah, so, so I, this is true, that you're never really alone, and I guess I would also argue that that's true in the sense of these microbes, which is what a bunch of what we're talking about now is about, and the microbes and the mites and what's physically on you. But it's also true relative to millions of other species on Earth that you depend on in all of these different ways and different uh, levels of connection and disconnection. And, and, and so I, I really think that, you know, existentialism is this idea that who we are is framed by our actions. And I'd like to think, like, if Kierkegaard was still alive, that he would incorporate the idea that it, and it also depends on our interactions, right? Um, and, and that those are really, really complex. And to take just one really simple example to close with, um, the example of wine. So, so until relatively recently, it was not clear how yeast arrived on grapes uh, and vineyards every year. It was known that it disappeared in the fall. And if you looked at grapes in the beginning of the season, they didn't have yeast. And if you took an average grape, and the average grape would not have yeast. If you took a dozen grapes, that one would have yeast, and that's why you mash them up, right? And that because then you spread that yeast. But it was not known where the yeast was coming from. And so here's this magical aspect of fermentation that's present in every glass. Well, it was just worked out this year or last year um, that one part of this story appears to involve wasps that wasps that overwinter in vineyards store up a whole bunch of yeast in their guts. 
And that when they go to forage on the grapes, that they accidentally introduce that yeast into the grapes. And so fermentation and that nice glass of wine, then it depends on this wasp that we've not actually studied very well, and it's gut microbes. And, and so there are all these stories of these complicated ways that everything that you take for granted every day depends on these kinds of interactions. And so if you want to see th things, if you squint and go outside, if you want to see what the world really looks like, it's you in this web of interactions next to another person in a web of interactions, but surrounded by this world of other species with all of these, these lines of interaction, some of which bump up in, against you in ways you can't possibly imagine. And that 99.9% .9 of those interactions we know nothing about. And that all of those interactions were changing more rapidly than we ever have before. And, and so this, I think, is a really important reality. And it's an inescapable reality that you'd be very, very hard-pressed to argue with that will affect you what, what, in whatever you do. Uh, and so to me, it's a reality to embrace because it presents an interesting way to engage the world. And if you're a writer, lots of stuff to write about. If you're a lawyer, lots of stuff to sue about. If you're a doctor, lots of stuff to fix. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll leave you there, but thank you very much for your time, and uh, these were great questions. I really enjoyed it a lot. So we really want to thank you a lot, Rob, not simply for spending time with us, but your fine book that everyone says that they enjoy. And once again, thanks for making the time to see us. Big round of applause. Thanks, thanks a lot, folks. Hope you all have a great afternoon. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.